hello to everybody on Zoom and some people here on in person. So welcome to this lecture on the first lecture on GANs. Uh, and uh, I'm Aprajit and Abu will also be there to like present this lecture. And uh, before we start, just a quick question. Is anyone uh, having the name GAN? Because last semester there was a guy named GAN and he was kind of startled throughout, this, throughout the lecture. Because, yeah, obviously. So just a quick question before that. So, yeah. So until now, uh, for the past uh, two, three lectures, we have been discussing about uh, generative models. So you have a you have a data distribution, and your model tries to generate data, new data from that distribution. It tries to learn the distribution and generates data from that distribution. So in this example, which is given, we have a set of faces, a data set consisting of uh, human faces, and our aim is to generate a new face which is very similar to the ones which are actually present on the data set. So a cool thing about uh, generating data and GANs is that if you can see the images there on the slides, they, they are actually very similar to real world images, but they are not. Uh, these people do not exist, and you can go to this website, this person doesn't, does not exist.com, and every time you reload the website, uh, you get a new face, and that person actually does not exist in this world. So even though the top left corner lady looks pretty, unfortunate that she doesn't exist. So moving on to the characterization of uh, discriminative and uh, generative models. So we have seen discriminative models which uh, model the conditional, distri uh, conditional distribution. So just, yeah. So if you have a distribution of data, like X is a part of data and circles are another uh, set of data. So what distribution uh, dis discriminative models do is that given a data, uh, what is the probability that it belongs to some class? So that's what uh, discriminative models find. And it, it aims to find a decision boundary which separates this, this set of data from this set of data. That's how discriminative models work. And the change in uh, generative models is that they try to find this distribution as the whole. So how can you characterize this distribution? So this is from a class and this is from another class. So the joint distribution is given by this formula. So this is basically the joint distribution in terms of probability. And uh, you could actually write this as P of Y, P of X given Y. So this is the probability of that uh, class, and uh, this is uh, the, the distribution of all data given that it's from a particular class. So for example, this distribution would be the probability of all data given that it's from, it's from the class of circles. And this would be the probability of all data given that it's from the cl class of Xs or pluses, so, so on. So in, gen in generative models, your aim is to just find the distribution of the data and not just to like uh, find the boundary which separates the data. So that's the whole goal of it. And uh, this is actually a pictorial representation of the same. So gener generative models try to learn the distribution of the data as shown. And yeah, uh, a disadvantage of discriminative models is that it just it's limited in scope and it's, it can just be used for classification tasks, and sometimes it can be used for a bit of regression tasks, but uh, generative models can also be used for discrimination. So this can also be written as, so this is the probability of data, and you can also find the discrimination or the decision boundary which separates the data. So generative models can also be used as a discriminative model, but the other way is not possible. But what becomes challenging for uh, generative models is that if you can, this is a very low dimensional subspace, but if you consider this, uh, the problem of generating images, new images, X will actually have a lot of features. So if you have like uh, 64 cross 64 image and three channels, you'll have like 
I don't know, just multiply all these, uh, all the three together, you, you'll have so many uh, features. And even if you like redu reduce the features with your convex to like 768 features, even that's pretty high. So the problem with this is that uh, the dimensionality of the input is pretty high and uh, uh, that makes the problem very complicated. And uh, characterizing these distributions will also be a little challenging. So that's the uh, hard part of the uh, generative problems. Yeah, so this is the problem which we are, uh, we are actually trying to solve, uh, learn a distribution and try to generate a new data from that distribution. Yeah, so until now we have seen about uh, uh, a generative model called VAE. So you just take a VAE, train it end to end, throw away the encoder and the decoder by itself is actually a generator. That's what the prof would have actually mentioned in this lecture. And if you actually give, uh, a random vector z, random latent vector z, which is sampled from a distribution p of z, which is most probably a Gaussian distribution, and pass it through the generator. The generator generates uh, a, a synthetic data. So you can actually consider uh, the decoder of a VAE to be a generator, the second half of the uh, VAE. And as you all know from the previous lectures, uh, this VAE is actually trained with the help of maximum likelihood, uh, max, uh, yeah, maximizing the likelihood of data. So what we have to consider is that, so just take this since, so consider that this is some subspace and this line represents the space of faces. Space of faces. And sampling points in this line gives you like human faces and so on. So maximizing the likelihood is basically maximizing the probability of the data which you actually have. So if you consider uh, data which is kind of a little far away here, uh, it's not really necessary that this might not be a face. There is a possibility that this might also be a face, but since we are actually maximizing the likelihood, the probability given to these points which may become face, may be faces, might be a little low. So that's what maximum likelihood does. So it just maximizes the probability of the training data and the other data, they, they might or might not be garbage, we do not know about it. So that's something which is not really ideal for a discriminator, uh, sorry, generator. So, and this actually does not give a direct relationship about it because uh, we do not know about these data which might or might not be garbage. So we have to make the uh, training criterion a little more direct. So yeah, before going on to this, what do you think is the most simplest way to evaluate a generative model? The most simplest way. So the naive, the most naive way to evaluate a generative model is that you just uh, generate, a, uh, generate a result and just, just look at it and say if it's okay, if it's real or not, that's the most naive way to do. But it's very unfortunate that you are not differentiable and you, we cannot find the gradients with respect to you, nor we can back propagate the gradients uh, into you. So that's very unfortunate. But we need this to, this to happen so that we can actually make our training criterion pretty direct. So in comes uh, uh, generative adversarial networks, GANs. So this actually have, uh, uh, GANs have two models. We have generative models, which is usually uh, uh, the VAE uh, the decoders of the VAE and adversarial is that it, it's made up of two two networks which try to compete against each, each other and networks is basically neural networks we are not trying to use any machine learning algorithms so yeah this was introduced in 2014 by Ian Goodfellow and uh, the goal is to model the distribution of data uh, here we are not using the notation p of uh, y comma x because you just have one set of data and this basically becomes P of X, so you don't have to worry about it. So our goal is to uh, model this distribution so that if, if we sample any data from that distribution, we get, uh, we get a data point which is similar to the real data. And as I told earlier, GANs have two networks, uh, the generator which generates data and the discriminator which does your job, the, dif the differential, uh, differentiable aspect of you uh, which evaluates the data. So this is the ba basic structure of GANs. So you have a generator, 
for, before that, you take a latent variable z, pass it through the generator, and the generator generates, we can call it as a fake data. And you also have a real uh, data distribution, and you have you take the data point from x. This is also passed to a discriminator. The discriminator tries to classify the uh, uh, the generated data as fake and uh, the real data as real. So it comes to a point that the aim of the generator should be in such a way that the generated data should be classified as real by the discriminator. So that's the whole goal. So initially, we want the discriminator the discriminator should actually classify the generated data by the generator to be fake. But as the training progresses by, generator should actually try to learn to produce data which is similar to real data, and the discriminator should be in a position to make mistakes. Yeah, going on to the uh, generator of GANs. So generator, the goal of the generator is actually to model the distribution, uh, PG of X, the uh, fake distribution, uh, to match the true distribution of data, which is PX of X. And that's the whole goal of uh, the generator. As I mentioned earlier, the latent vector, uh, vector can be sampled from a Gaussian distribution as well. So the aim of the discriminator is just, it's, it's just a binary classific uh, classifier. You have real images and you have fake images. The real images are the images with, from your data set and the fake images are the, uh, uh, are the images uh, generated by the generator. So your aim for the discriminator is that it has to learn to classify disc, uh, generated data as fake and the real data as like real. But as the training progresses by, the discriminator should be in a position to make mistakes so, so that your, dis, your generator is doing a good job in generating data which is close to real data. So yeah, the aim is that if a, if a perfect discriminator is fooled, meaning, if the fake data generated by the generator is classified real, uh, fooling, the generate, uh, fooling the discriminator, then the generator has done a good job in generating data which is pretty good. Now, moving on to something, a little math. Uh, I didn't realize that this was so hard when prof, yeah, yeah, it's pretty hard. Prof pulled it very easily. Yeah, so moving on to some maths. So consider that, consider that you have two distributions. So this, these two, consider that this is the distribution of your fake data and this is the distribution of your real data. So the perfect discriminator or any good discriminator would find a boundary which separates two regions as fake and real. So what happens here is that, first it finds the ideal boundary as this, the crossing, the place where it cross, both the distributions cross, and assigns this region as fake and anything towards the side as real. So that's what uh, the discriminator basically does first. But what you can actually see is that these regions here are the regions of the data which, which are misclassified. So these are the places where the discriminator is actually making errors. So you might have seen this in base error rate. So this is, this is the erroneous uh, regions of the discriminator. So now the goal of the generator is to produce uh, a point, a data point, which is here, like which is on the other side of the fake region. In this way, the discriminator makes an error classifying this point. So if it makes an error, the decision boundary will be shifted in such a way that this point comes to the fake region again. So from this, uh, the uh, distribution of the fake data is shifted and the uh, discriminator finds a new decision boundary such that the fake data point which is generated by the generator is on the actual fake side of the boundary. And uh, the discriminator finds, tries to like work hard to find a, a boundary which kind of minimizes this error. This happens continuously and at a point of time, you have your fair, real data distribution and the fake data just goes on top of it. So when this happens, discriminator makes like huge amount of errors but 
your generator has learned to generate fake data, which is close to the real data. So that's the whole training objective of GANs. So these slides actually mention a bit about those. Um, yeah, uh, the first thing is that the first step in training GANs is that to do this, you actually need a discriminator which can actually find the decision boundary between uh, two distributions, right? So the first step is to like train the discriminator and the training examples for the discriminator are like, since it's a binary classification problem, you need real examples and synthetic examples or fake ones. So the real examples are the examples from your data set. And uh, the synthetic examples are the examples from uh, the current state discriminator. So whatever the, uh, sorry, generator. Whatever the generator uh, generates in the current step, that will be used as synthetic data for, the, for training the discriminator. So, and uh, usually it's trained to minimize the cross, binary cross entropy loss. And yeah, the next step is uh, that the uh, discriminator's loss is back propagated to the, to the generator and the generator needs, training the generator involves generating data, which when classified by the discriminator, it should be classified as uh, real. So that's how a generator is trained to maximize the discriminator loss, even though like for example, the training data, the uh, generated data from the discriminator is fake. It should actually uh, learn to produce uh, an output of one by the discriminator. So yeah, so this uh, slide gives the formulation for it. So for real data X, the desired output of the discriminator D of X is one because obviously it's the data which you already have and you want to find the distribution of those, that data. And the log probability is, of, is log D. For the synthetic data X hat, the desired output of the discriminator is uh, D of X hat is equal to zero because we know that that's the synthetic data and the discriminator, this is during the training step of uh, the discriminator. For the synthetic data, it should produce the output zero. And the corresponding log probability is uh, one minus uh, D of X or G of C. So this is the first step in training GANs, and after this, we actually have a poll. It's a PDF. Hello. Okay, cool. I guess we'll wait another 20 seconds for you guys to finish that super difficult poll. Oh. Also, I just realized that the number of Piazza posts on uh, in our class is absurdly high and it happens every time. I just noticed that 1,681 is an enormous number for Piazza posts. I think it's pretty cool. Okay, I think that's about time for the poll. Um, one thing that you guys need to keep in mind is uh, what Aparajit mentioned, that the first thing we need to do in training again is to have a good discriminator, right? And the reason for that is if you don't have somebody telling the generator how to generate images, the generator really won't be able to make things which look like what you want it to look like. I mean, in theory, you could do it the other way as well, but the math works out a lot nicer once we have a good discriminator first. But we'll get to that in a second. The first, we want to visit something known as information, and information in math terms, right? 
Now, let me, I mean, we have, we have these two sentences here, which is today I don't see, I didn't see a tornado, and the other, the other sentence is today I did see a tornado. A quick question to anybody on Zoom or the few of you here. And the answer is on the slide, but which of the two sentences obviously contains more information? The one on the bottom, right? And the reason is clear, because the one on the bottom is an event that does not happen that often, right? And the same concept can be applied to things like NLP, because if you have a sentence which the only words that it has are the articles a, an, and the, it doesn't tell you much because those words are super common and you don't really get much information out of that sentence, right? So the information content in any sort of set of data or set of events is more when the probability of that event is low, right? Which is why the negative log of P of X, which is the probability of the event X, sort of makes sense as a formulation for how much information content there is. Now, what is entropy? Right? And we've all heard the term cross entropy because we've done all these homeworks and we know that it's a loss function to, for classification, X, Y, and Z. But what is entropy really? So entropy is just a weighted average of information content in a bunch of events. Right? In other words, it's a measure of uncertainty. And the way it's calculated is, as I said, it's a weighted average. And the weights are the probabilities of the events happening. Right? And all of this sort of comes together in a bit. This is sort of just an interesting thing, but I will come to this at the end of the lecture if we have time. But let's get to cross entropy. And cross entropy, and the word cross here really means that instead of measuring the probability of the event under the same distributions P of X and P of X, what we do is we measure the probability of an event X under two different distributions, QX and P of X. And this obviously looks a lot more familiar to you guys because this is exactly the, the loss function we use for classification, right? And now let's get to binary cross entropy, right? This is very, very close to what we're doing here today because the discriminator is really just a binary classifier. Right? It tries to classify all the real images as one and all the fake images as zero, and that's the training data that we feed it. But essentially, the binary cross entropy formula opens up to look like this, like a large summation term. And the reason why it works out is because P of X can really only take two values, either zero or one. And when it's zero, the first term cancels out and the second term stays in. And when it's one, the second term cancels out and the first term stay stays in. Right? And hopefully uh, you guys can understand why we can write it as an expectation because expectation opens up to be a weighted sum with probabilities. Right. So coming back to the discriminator, right? the discriminator wants to minimize the binary cross entropy loss with respect to real and fake images so that it can correctly classify real images as real and fake images as fake. Right. So the first term here corresponds to what it thinks is the true data, and the second term corresponds to what is the fake data here. There, if you want to, I mean, you should notice that there is a bar over P data here, and that just represents the complement of the distribution. So everything outside of the real data is fake. And we can sort of reword this to be true and generated images now, because our X can be re replaced by G of Z, and Z is our latent latent vector that we sample from. Right, this is pretty important. Going forward, we, we, will be, we will be referring to P data as P of capital X because capital X is our data distribution. So if we just drop the negative sign, then instead of minimizing the binary cross entropy, the discriminator can achieve the same output by maximizing the same term just without the negative sign outside it, right? But the generator wants to fool the discriminator. It wants to make sure that the discriminator cannot be a perfect classifier. So it wants to minimize the same term that the discriminator is trying to maximize. And with that, we get to this formulation of the GAN loss. It's a parity between minimizing and maximizing of the same term 
And the reason why one of them is colored in red is because generator really only affects the second term, right? So while the discriminator is trying to maximize it, the generator is trying to minimize it, and that's where sort of this adversarialness comes in. Right, and this is the old formula that we saw. Well, something to notice here is the reason why we can write this as x sampled from p of g, and this becomes even more important later, is because a generative adversarial network or GAN is something known as an implicit model. And before I go on, does anybody know what's the difference between an explicit model and an implicit model of probability distributions? Any wild guess? Right, exactly. So the explicit model exactly knows what probability distribution I'm sampling from, right? And it can, if you give it a data point, it will tell you where it is with respect to that probability distribution or how probable that data point X is. An implicit model cannot do that, right? An implicit model has, and correctly named, an implicit understanding of what distribution the data comes from, but it can sort of achieve the same point of generating the data. Right? Of course, if a model already has the distribution that it's outputting, you can sample from that distribution and get a data point. But you can also do the same with an implicit model. But what making, an, what making it implicit does is it makes the GAN formulation what's called as likelihood free. And that's also part of what makes the math in it pretty simple. Right? OK, this is what we mentioned before. The objective of the discriminator is to put d of x as 1 and d of g of z as zero, and the objective of the generator is to make sure that the discriminator cannot put zero for images that it has generated, right? And this is kind of what we've seen before. So say we have this sort of a setup where the red distribution talks about the fake data, the blue distribution talks about the real data, and what the generator will try to do is, and as uh, we already have here, it will try to generate more and more images on the real side of the, of, the, of the decision boundary. And the more it tries to generate points here, the peak will start shifting this way. And it will sort of start to peak at the point where it's starting to generate more and more images. And then the discriminator needs to do a better job, and it tries to push its decision boundary to be here, which is what we did here. So now the points that it classified as falsely real now actually fall on the side of uh, the fake data, right? So this is just shown here in a bunch of slides. We shift our distribution towards the real side, and then the discriminator gets better, and then the generator gets even better, and the discriminator needs to follow. So there's this sort of a loop which goes on. The discriminator learns a perfect boundary. The generator then learns to push its distribution past this boundary. Then the discriminator needs to learn a new perfect boundary and this sort of interplay between them keeps going on. And this is where the most important math part of this whole lecture comes in. And unfortunately for the few of you guys here, I will try to make this as interactive as possible. So I might be asking you guys a few questions as we go along just to make sure that the math makes sense to everybody, right? So bear with me here. and. Um, a note for anybody watching the lecture later, please make sure that you watch this on uh, the Zoom recording because you'll be able to control how large our part of the screen is. So what we have here is we have a minimizing X objective and a maximizing objective. And it looks sort of like expectation of a data point coming from P of X with log of D of X plus an expectation of some latent variable z coming from some distribution p of z, and you put log of 1 minus d of g of. Hopefully, the number of brackets closing is correct here. OK. So first question, how do we open an expectation term? What's the formula for expectation? Correct. What if it's what if it's a continuous variable? It's integral. Right. 
So I can write this term here as an integral over all of, all of x, probability of x times this function here, log of d of x dx. Correct? Does it make sense? Right? Similarly, I can write this term here as an integral over all of z, probability, and this is over probability distribution of x, probability of z of this latent variable z, log of 1 minus d of g of z, dz. Right? And this is where the implicit nature of GANs really comes to shine, because we can't merge these two integrals yet, right? Because they're integrating over a different sort of variable which is distributed differently. But what we can do here is we can replace this term and this term and this term by using the implicit model that the GAN has. So we can just assign a, a probability P of G of X to some data point X. And then our equation for the right hand side or this after this plus sign starts to look like you can integrate this over all of x, p of g of x, log of 1 minus d of x, dx. Right? Any questions so far? Awesome. So this means that we can merge the two integrals into one. Right? So, okay. We might run out of board space here, but, and hopefully I don't make any math mistakes. But now our whole integral looks like this. We have P of X of X log of DX plus P of G of X log of one minus DX DX. Right? And this is the formulation for the loss function. And let's try to see if we can find the optimum point for a discriminator. And how do we optimize an equation? How do we find optimums in an equation, minima or maxima? Derivative and set to zero. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the derivative of this with respect to the discriminator and set it to zero. Yeah? So let's try to take the derivative of this equation inside of it and try to set it to zero. Hopefully this should be pretty simple. What would be the derivative of this first term with respect to dx? How would you differentiate this first term with respect to dx? Uh, just, uh, one over. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right, so what we have is we have p of x of x over d of x, correct? Similarly, the second term will open up to have a negative sign because there's a negative sign here. It'll have p of g of x over one minus d of x. And we set this to zero. Yeah, with me so far? How does this work with the individual? I mean, we, we're just setting the whole thing to zero. So if we individually by part set everything to zero, the integral of, it, of the whole thing would also be zero. So we're just sort of differentiating the inner function here with respect to dx. Right? And so we can just set this part to zero. And if you rearrange the terms, you'll sort of find that the optimum point of the discriminator, the optimum function of discriminator, which I can call d star of x, comes out to be p of x of x over p of x of x plus p of g of x. With me so far? Any questions on Zoom? Okay, so this is what's there on the slide as the optimum Bayes classifier, right? All it does is maybe in the absence of all information, assigns the probability of real data to be the, 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 the probability of the data point under the real distribution over the sum 
of the probability of the data point on the real as well as the generated distribution. Right, so now we have the optimum classifier. And yep, this slide is just for the blackboard. The math is at the end of the slide deck, you can see it. It may be a little illegible right now because it's my handwriting, and if it is, we'll fix it. But let's move on. So once we have the optimum discriminator, we can now try to make a generator which will beat this optimum discriminator, right? This is the best a discriminator can do, and we'll try to beat this by making a better generator, right? So how do we do that? Is we'll do it on this board. Awesome. So I'm going to write the equation of our found discriminator to be p of x over x divided by p of x plus pg of x. And we're going to put this equation into the objective that we're now trying to minimize with respect to g. So what we're going to do is we want to minimize with respect to g the expectation over p x of log of dx plus the expectation over p g of log of 1 minus dx. Oops. I've run out of chalk. Okay, cool. So let me plug this equation in here as well as here. What we get is something which looks like, and I'm gonna ignore this minimizer for a bit. We're only gonna work with the equation. And it's gonna look like the expectation over p of x of log of p of x of some data point x over the x of x plus pg of x plus the expectation over pg of and 1 minus d of x is just going to be p of log of p of g of x over p of x of x plus p of g of x. Any doubts so far? The few of you are lucky, you can ask doubts in person. But any doubts so far? Does this math kind of make sense? All we've done is we've plugged in the value of the optimum discriminator that we found into the equation that we're trying to minimize for the generator. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So what we're gonna do here is going to look kind of silly, but it's going to work out really well. What we'll do is we'll add a term of log four and then subtract the same term log four. Yeah? This looks silly, I agree, but it will make sense in just a bit. You can write log four as being two log two. Yeah, that makes sense because four can be written as two power two and logarithm of exponential, the exponentiator comes out. Yeah, so it looks like log two twice. And this we can write as log two plus log two. Yeah? It's still kind of silly, but wait for it to make sense, right? We can take each of these log twos and add them here and here because log of a plus log of b is log of a times b, right? So now our equation starts to look like twice of px and twice of pg, and this log four term goes away. Yeah, but we still have this negative log four, right? And this is still silly, admittedly, right? But look at what happens now. If you take this two and put it under here, and take this two and put it under here, this term now resembles the KL divergence of P of X under X, and P of X and the sum or the average probability of the data point X under X and G. Yeah, and it's going to look like DKL, which is the KL divergence of P of X of X, and p of x of x plus p of g of x over two. 
And this term similarly starts to look like dkl of p of g of x plus p of x of x, I mean, comma, plus p of g of x over 2. And minus the log 4. Yeah? Any questions about how we went from here to here? There's, there's math on the slides at the end, and you'll see that the equation for KL divergence between P and Q is just the expectation of log of P over Q. Yeah? And here we're going to do one more silly thing. We're going to take these two KL divergence terms and multiply them by 2 over 2. Yeah? This does nothing to the equation. But what it allows us to do is it allows us to take this denominator 2 and put it under both of these KL divergences. Right? Now, this looks like the average of two KL divergence terms between P of xx, P of gx, and the average of the two. Right? If you look at this square bracketed term alone, do you think this function is symmetrical? What I mean is if I swap the values of x, of P of x and P of g, will it make any difference? No, right? And that's precisely what this does. It makes it a symmetric variant of the KL divergence. This is what's known as the Jensen-Shannon divergence, which is denoted as DJSD, which for two distributions P and Q is given as DKL of P and P plus Q by 2 plus DKL of Q, P plus Q by 2 over 2. Right? I know it's a, it's, it's a bunch of math, but does this make sense? Right? And we have this weird little log 4 term sort of hanging around here. But the reason why it's there on the slide is because we used the plus log 4 term to get to the Jensen-Shannon divergence. And from there, and we're going to erase this now. The objective for our discriminator, or sorry, our generator, ends up becoming minimizing twice the Jensen-Shannon divergence between P of x for some variable x, P g for some variable x, minus this weird log 4 term. Right? So with the optimum discriminator, with the optimal discriminator, what the generator is trying to do is it's trying to minimize the Jensen-Shannon divergence between what it generates versus what's the real data. And this Jensen-Shannon divergence has some pretty nice properties. Here's the formula that we saw before, that the Jensen-Shannon divergence can be written as the average of two KL divergence terms, which is one between P and the average of P and Q, and Q and the average of P and Q, which obviously means that this is a symmetrical function. And this has the nice property that it doesn't explode or exaggerate the values with respect to what, which of P and Q really turns the probability to zero, right? It also helps us get fewer log zero terms, right? I mean, one of the simple ways you can make KL divergence symmetric is you can add P of, KL of PQ plus KL of QP, and that would be symmetric as well, right? But that'll have a bunch of log zero terms because there'll be a lot of data points where the real distribution is zero and a bunch of data points where the fake distribution is zero, and we don't know how to handle these log zero terms. The only case where here we'll get a log zero is when both P and Q assign it zero probability, and in that case, we'll multiply it by zero as well because in the expectation term, there's a P of X for over G or capital X there. So we don't really care. Okay, that was a bunch of math. Any questions on all of this math? Because after this, it becomes conceptual again. All right? Any questions on Zoom? Awesome. Either people are super confused and don't know what to ask, or everything is crystal clear. I hope it's the latter.
Uh, but okay. Hi. Yeah. I was wondering how did you uh like brought the log for inside the expectation. Oh, yeah, I can I can show you that pretty simply. So the the expectation term can be written as a large sum, correct? Yes. Yeah. And we all understand how log of some x plus log of some y equals the log of x y. Yes. Right? So all we've done is sort of added this log y term to the expectation of x and this also comes from this thing called linearity of expectation where the expected value so if you add some the expectation of fx and if you add some variable a to it this can be written as the expectation of fx plus a what this means is you're essentially shifting the mean of all of the values of fx by a right so the expectation of anything is sort of the mean of that thing right okay and so when you shift the mean of a whole distribution by some constant a it's the same as finding the mean of the shifted distribution by a right so say we have and this is a super tiny piece of chalk but let's see if we can make it work yeah we have a bunch of points here which have a centroid somewhere in the middle right and if you shift that centroid this way by some distance a the centroid lies here and all the points now lie around it correct yes instead we moved all the points by some distance a and took the mean we would end up at the same point yeah right that's that's where the linearity of expectation comes in it's a it's 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 a pretty foundational term in statistics i didn't expect you guys to know it so thank you for asking that but essentially that is how we moved the log 2 term which is a constant it doesn't depend on x right so it wouldn't change as the distribution shifts over x or x or g and we can just add that log 2 term inside the expectation function does that make sense yes awesome any other questions okay thank you awesome so this is as you mentioned it tries to minimize the jensen shannon divergence between pg and px and once again pg is the implicit distribution or implicit probability that the generator assigns to a point small x right so what this means is there is a stationary point between this minimization and maximization objective right as the as the discriminator gets better it stabilizes itself at the base optimal point and the generator will try to push its distribution to the other side and the discriminator will get better and it will push it to the other side and the discriminator will still get better but as the discriminator keeps getting better the the base error rate also keeps increasing because there is more and more overlap between the generated distribution and the real distribution and eventually in the limit and this is what we hope happens the distributions of the real data and the generated data completely overlap with each other so that the peaks are at the same point right and now the best a discriminator can do is guess at random right because and hopefully there is a little bit more chalk left because if we have one distribution here and another completely overlapping distribution here the best a discriminator can do is sort of put itself in the middle and then it's a coin toss right is this point real or fake we can't tell if this point real or fake it can't really tell it has to sort of randomly guess right and this random guessing is unfortunately also the case for a random classifier right if at the beginning all you have is a random classifier which throws around guesses that yeah this is real this is fake it won't really able to tell the discriminator anything important which is why we first need to train the discriminator to be non random right so that it tells something important to our generator right and of course the stationary points need not be stable because the generator might overshoot undershoot things of that nature can happen but we won't get into that for now this is more important right because if we don't train the two things together 
then information won't flow well. If the discriminator is not trained well enough, for example, it's, it's a random classifier, it will just give not very important feedback to the generator, right? If for the same image, the discriminator says real and then it says fake, it, it knows nothing about what to do. The generator got opposing feedbacks, right? Or, or if the discriminator is too well-trained, then there is no local feedback coming in. It doesn't know how it can do better. And this is what Abrajit mentioned, that the discriminator needs to be in a position where it can still make some mistakes, right? Because in ML, and most of life, we learn through mistakes, right? So if things are going well, there's nothing for us to change and nothing for us to learn, right? Cool, so this is where we get to the training formulation of CAN. We need to sort of train them jointly, and we first need to arrive at a decent enough discriminator. So we can do this in batches. In one batch, we can take a bunch of uh, generated images, a bunch of real images, assign the real images an automatic label of one, assign the fake images an automatic label of zero, and then train the discriminator. And once we have a discriminator, we can start generating more images, try to feed those through the discriminator, and try to see if the discriminator correctly classifies them as zero, or it is actually fooled and it starts to classify them as one, right? And of course, what we want at the end is a generative model, and we can sort of throw away the discriminator once everything is good, right? This sounds okay, but GANs are super hard to train because there are a bunch of problems that we can face, something like mode collapse can happen. Anybody knows what mode collapse means? I used to be a super fan of physics, and we had this thing called probability collapse that happens over uh, event distribution, right? Everything's a probability, Schrodinger's equation, and once you observe something, the probability collapses, and all of it lies at the point of observation. The same thing sort of happens here, is if your distribution has a bunch of modes or a bunch of different dimensions to describe it, if a GAN can't sort of cover everything, it'll just drop everything that it can't cover and focus on things that it can. So what this means is, it can possibly find that one super hyper-realistic image that the discriminator can't say that it's fake and keep generating that, right? I mean, what good is a generator if it always generates the same face, right? If, if, the, if the website we saw before, which is this person does not exist, each time you reload it, it shows you the same picture of the person, what good is that website? It's correct, that person doesn't exist, but I mean, we want a few bunch of different faces coming out from the GAN, right? So they can produce really, really good images, and we'll see some examples in a bit. But they are super tedious to train. And since homework five is about GANs, hopefully you'll see, or hopefully you won't see that they're terrible to train, and you'll be able to find ways to actually train them. Just for the 685 people. Yeah, just for the 685 people. But um, yeah. Hopefully towards the end of this, I mean, I think we have enough time to go over the code as well, right? Awesome, okay, cool. So uh, yeah, of course, there's a bunch of variants of uh, GAN. You must have heard of, I mean, hopefully maybe you've heard of Cycle GAN or Star GAN or this Washerstein GAN, which sounds like that sauce from Britain that nobody can pronounce. But um, is that the spelling? I don't know, maybe. Um, okay, so how do we make sure that the discriminator works well? Right? One way to do it is to sort of eyeball the discriminator. But that'll be sort of weird, right? The whole reason we have a discriminator is because we don't want to eyeball what the generator does. So if we put somebody else in and then we have to focus on them, then we've sort of kept our work and employed somebody else as well. It's a waste of labor. So what we can do is we can also computationally figure out how well our discriminator is functioning. And we won't go into too many details here, but essentially what they do is they take a very good face classifier and try to feed these generated images through the classifier. And the idea is hopefully the classifier is able to classify this face as one of the categories that it's trying to do. Inception V3 is one of those images, image classifiers which came out at some point and became really big, topped the leaderboards for a bunch of uh, face classification tasks. And here's where entropy comes in again, right? We want the model to not be super uncertain of what, what's happening. If it has, if it's trying to classify between 100 things, and the distribution is just uniform over all of those 100. That just means that what we've given, it doesn't look like anything. It doesn't know what to call it. So we want to have low entropy in its label or probability distribution and its outputs, right? And that's what they call as an, as an inception score. The reason why it's called inception score is because it comes from inception V3. 
Hey, it's just a measure. It's just to see how well is my discriminator doing at some point. It's an evaluative metric. So, so far, we've seen VAEs and GANs as two large varieties of generative networks. So the main, main key difference is that VAEs try to minimize KL divergence between the real data and the generated data, tries to maximize the likelihood that's assigned to the generated data under the real data, and GANs instead try to minimize the Jensen-Shannon divergence between generated data and what's real. Right? One of them is symmetric, one of them is not. One of them is much nicer, much smoother, much easier to work with. The other one's sort of not. KL divergence is just super convenient. That's why we use it everywhere. And once you take a derivative or a gradient over it, the self term goes away and all you're left with is cross. And that's where cross entropy comes in. I'm sure we went over this a bunch of lectures ago, initial lectures, right? Um, right. Another difference is VAE sort of have this encoder which during training first takes in a bunch of images, tries to find the best latent representation of the distribution. We sample from it and then we generate a new image, where in, instead in GAN, it's a much simpler formulation. You have somebody trying to generate it and somebody looking over the generation to make sure that the generation is good, right? Um, however, although VAEs are very complex, the math is weird. VAEs are super easy and nice to train. It's just easier to achieve convergence with VAEs and, and, and a stable convergence, and not a non-stable convergence, while, whereas GANs are very hard to train. There's a lot of noise uh, happening, and it's really hard to optimize the learning process. Right? However, with that shortcut of easy learning, you get blurry images coming out, right? noisy outputs coming out. And with the labor of having a hard optimization task, you get much sharper results. Any questions so far? Okay. So this is from the original paper from Ian Goodfellow in 2014 by GAN. The rightmost images are what GAN produced, and everything before that are other generative networks. Clearly, the GAN's images are the crispest. I think, I think it's the most easiest uh, observed in the first, I mean, in the top left image and the bottom left image, uh, that the rightmost results are the most clear cut. Right. And with time, of course, they've gotten even better. The images are super hyper-realistic. I mean, I would believe this person exists, right? But probably they don't. And um, yeah, you can do something like style transfer as well uh, with Stargan. Uh, the style essentially here uh, maybe represents the emotion uh, shown on the face of a person, and you can sort of apply that style on a random image, and you get the image in that style, so you can, you can get somebody angry, happy, or fearful, or all these different emotions. It's, pre it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, these are just more examples of GANs doing really well. And since our project needs 10 minutes, I'm going to take two more minutes to talk about something that I find super interesting and we sort of glossed over, which is how, not to put you out of context, but how sort of softmax and entropy sort of work together. Right? It'll just take two minutes. Right? And you can sort of do an experiment over this by yourself. So softmax, which is exponentiation of a variable divided by the sum of the exponent gives you a probability distribution. Right? It sums up to one. It has all those probability features. There's also something you might have heard of, which is called the Boltzmann distribution. Right? It's very popular in pure science, but it also becomes popular in computer science because with this temperature term, which is this tau, you can sort of control how much entropy there is in your softmax distribution. And what it does, real quick, is a high value of this temperature makes your distribution hot. And if you remember from high school physics or middle school physics, warmer gases have more entropy, they have more energy, they're going everywhere. Cooler systems have less energy, less entropy, and there's less movement. And that's precisely what happens. High values of tau makes your distribution uniform. Right? That means the distribution of probability is equal everywhere as the, the more you increase your temperature. And the more you cool it, the more it focuses on where the distribution is max. So at, at zero temperature, which will sort of cause calculation issues, but let's say some epsilon temperature, you will get essentially all the probability mass comes into what's the maximum probability and everything else goes to zero. 
And at something like 100,000, 10,000, it sort of approaches uniformness. And you guys can sort of try this using NumPy and Matplotlib. It's, it's pretty cool. I just wanted to plug this in, something I find super cool. And since we were talking about entropy and information, we could have, but yeah. I think with that, we can come to uh, some code that Aparajan can present. Till then, any questions? So when you switched off, uh, you have to log in again. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh. It just froze. Hello. Yeah, good that Abu talked about uh, the Boltzmann distribution. Uh, in the attention is all you need paper. If you take the softmax, before that you will actually divide it by the key value size. So I was doing it. I didn't realize that I was actually doing the Boltzmann distribution. And you'll also be forced to do it in homework four. So yeah, that's also there. So we thought of actually sharing a bit of code also to give this lecture a bit of a good conclusion so that you also understand how GANs are implemented for uh, our generation. So I went over this for homework five people last week. So this is kind of a cool application. So the reference code which I actually followed is here about DC GAN. And uh, uh, this is the data set. You can actually uh, join this Kaggle competition and download uh, Monet art uh, competitions, like the basic imports for your homework two things. And uh, these are some helper functions to like normalize. So we usually normalize to like get some faster training and everything. So uh, this faster convergence. So this unnormalized function basically uh, just as the name suggests, unnormalize the normalized data so that you can get it back to the zero and one, zero to one range or zero to two fifty five range. Show images just helps you to show show images configs. These are all the standard things which you already saw in your homeworks. A bigger? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it is it fine now? Hmm? Switch off the lights. No. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So this is basically the normal uh, data set class, and this is derived from the test data set class from homework two P two. I've just renamed it and just named it uh, like gave different paths, that's it. And uh, you have transforms for augmenting your images. So I remember telling a lot of people not to use vertical flip for homework 2, P2, because it doesn't make sense seeing uh, people's face inverted. But here we are actually in, uh, aiming to like generate art like this, like art by Monet. And uh, seeing art like this, like in, a, in the proper orientation and just rotating your head and seeing you get a different art. So. That's something which artists will understand and they'll just say that those are two different art forms. So you have the normalize. Uh, we usually uh, for GANs, I'm guessing 0 0.5 is used, for, uh, used but uh, yeah, it's just a design choice. You can even use something else about uh, like the image net. If the data set, the mean and standard deviations are kind of similar. So plotting some images from the training data set, you have these art, which are actually uh, kind of looking good as arts. And uh, I used uh, an image size of 64 because it helps in faster uh, training. So going on to the GAN model, this is just a normal weight initialization function, and you have a generator. So as mentioned earlier, generator takes in a latent variable uh, from some distribution P of Z, and when it is passed through the generator, it, gen it generates a data. So this latent vector is of dimension 100. And after it gets passed through the generator, you get an image of size uh, 3 cross 64 cross 64. So that's the final output of the generator. And uh, you are defining a generator now. This is the summary, like just straight, the uh, standard stuff. And the discriminator is basically a binary classifier. It takes in a 3 cross 64 cross 64 uh, image and at the end it just produces one output. We use a sigmoid because uh, we'll be using the binary cross entropy and uh, having a value between zero and one kind of helps binary cross entropy and you have one 
output, which is basically the class information zero or one. And this is just a wrapper class to make sure the generator and the discriminator are inside one whole network. It's not even a module class. And I just wrote it because this makes it similar to homework by GANs, so no reason behind it. If we follow the PyTorch reference, they'll be using two different networks. So moving on to the training configurations, as we mentioned like quite a few times, we'll be using the binary cross entropy loss on the discriminator. So the discriminator learns to discriminate between fake and real data. And this fixed noise vector is just for evaluation. So you use this noise vector and see how this noise vector gives images. So that's why we actually have a fixed noise vector and you'll get to understand why in a bit. So real label is one, fake label is zero. The, uh, the generator has its own optimizer. The discriminator has its own optimizer, as you can see. So the generator parameters are passed here. The discriminator parameters are passed here. So both have their own optimizer. The first thing which we'll be doing to train a GAN is to like train the discriminator first, as we mentioned a lot of times. Zero grading, the basic things. You can you can all either zero grad the optimizer or some some people actually do model zero grad. It just makes sure that everything inside the gradients inside the models are like zeroed out, so anything can be done. Uh, you get the real data. This is the real like assuming that this data is from the data loader. You get the real data. And as Abu mentioned in the later half, labels for the real data would be one. So you fill, you have a torch tensor with the ones and pass in the real data through the discriminator in this uh, code. And you calculate the cross entropy, binary cross entropy loss where the label is one for real data. The next step is to train with fake, fake data. So you have a random vector, like random latent vector, you generate it of the shape like 100 cross, one cross one here in this example. And uh, you get the fake data by passing this noise vector inside the generator. And the labels for this process is fake labels, which is zero. So it means that uh, the, the actual labels for the fake, fake data generated from the generator should actually be zero. And uh, this is then trained with the same binary cross entropy loss and the error is back propagated. So this is the first step in training GANs where you first train a discriminator first with real, real images. And then the, op the goal of the, the first part is just to maximize this. And the second part is to, second part is uh, generator, but yeah. So this basically, uh, the training with real data maximizes this portion and the fake data maximizes this portion of the equation which we uh, showed earlier. So this is the training step of discriminator. Then moving on to the generator, you have the fake images generated by the generator in the previous step. So you have that, you have your real data here from the data loader and uh, again, uh, zero grading everything and here, uh, you'll be uh, passing the fake data and getting the output of the discriminator. But since you're training the generator here, the labels for it should be one because in this step, the uh, output of the generator should actually be predicted as one by the discriminator. So that's how it works, right? In this step, uh, the networks are kind of competing with each other. So fake in this step, fake labels, fake data has a label of one because it's the generator training step. And you get the loss, you back propagate the loss, and so on, that's it. Uh, these are like pretty common steps. And this is actually a, a training loop which I've written just to like monitor how it goes. And this code is just straight out of the box. You can just run it from top. You don't have to modify anything. It'll just work fine, uh, just for you to understand how GANs work. So in the first epoch, if you see, you just have like random noise. It's, it's basically nothing. But uh, for some people, this might also be art, so who knows, but it's subjective. So, but for me, it's at least noise for me. So as the epoch progresses by, you can see that the generator images are now doing, are kind of looking close to Monet art. And after uh, training for like 500 or more than that epochs, you get, you start to get pretty decent images, which are kind of similar to the ones which I showed earlier. 
So, and after 500 epochs, let's see how it goes. So you'll get, yeah, you'll get okayish images. Yeah, you can see these images are pretty good, right? They kind of look like Monet art. So that's the whole goal. But as Abu mentioned earlier, it takes a lot of time for convergence and this didn't take like a lot of time because the images are downsampled. But people working on homework five will actually face the issue that they'll have to train it for like 2000 epochs and convergence happens only after like 600 epochs. So training GANs will be a pain, so yeah. Cool, that's it. This is the implementation aspect of uh, GANs and uh, thank you all for coming, so yeah. One more thing before we, uh, slides. Slides? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to ask uh, for a little feedback if these slides here, uh, is this legible? If it is, I'll let it be and have sort of my own artwork on the slides. If it's not, I can try to type it out and sort of make it more professional. This one is colorful though. So maybe that, maybe that works for it. If this is readable, that's, I can just leave it be. Awesome, okay, cool. Um, I think, yeah, thank you all for coming. It's snowing outside, maybe hopefully it stops snowing now. But yeah, have a great rest of the, rest of the day and the weekend and the Thanksgiving weekend. Christmas and New Year and whatever comes comes there. Homework All right, four. and homework four and homework five for six eight five people and the project and uh, yeah. <laughs>